Why don't we get started? Thank you all for coming. Um, so uh, this is a joint work uh, between myself uh, and Piotr and uh, one of Piotr's colleagues uh, in Warsaw and also Yuyang, who um, is at Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And one of his students is also here uh, working with us on some other related research. Uh, Piotr, let me just introduce Piotr. Uh, since I'm also kind of uh, hosting this talk and also participating in it. Piotr is a labor economist, and he's the founder and president of the board of the Institute for Structural Research, which is an institute based in Warsaw. Um, in the past, he was affiliated to Warsaw uh, School of Economics, Department of Economics, and he's collaborated with the Ministry of Labor and Social Policy and the Chancellor of the Presidency, as well as UNDP in Poland. Uh, his research interests are in labor, market institutions, minimum wages, temporary contracts on labor market segmentation, the influence of technology on employment, pensions and social policy, economic studies of Central and Eastern Europe post-transition countries, as well as the labor market effects of climate and energy policies. And the institutional background uh, for how we became collaborators is that our institute, IMS, uh, had a project with the World Bank for several years on jobs and development. Uh, and that project established a network of institutes around the world working on issues related to employment and labor policies. And the institute, our institute was the institute in Asia, and Piotr's was the institute in uh, Central Eastern Europe. And we also had partner institutions in India and in Africa and Latin America. And so we worked quite a lot um, as directors of our institutes together in planning the activities of the network. And now we co-organize every year with the World Bank and IZA Institute uh, for the Study of Labor headquartered in um, Germany, an annual conference on jobs and development. And uh, we had one last year in DC and we're gonna have another one. Uh, last year was in Columbia. Uh, this year, the conference is going to be in Washington, D.C. at the World Bank uh, in June, at the beginning of June. And this is something that we co-host uh, annually, and both of our institutes are involved as partners of that event. Okay, so uh, today, I'll, I'm going to start Let's today. Start. We're, gonna, we're both going to present. I'm going to present at the beginning and, and let Piotr do most of the work, actually, presenting um, the main methods and results. I just want to focus a little bit on the motivation. So uh, this is, I think, this is the first paper I've been involved in that is really a cross-country paper. Uh, and it's ambitious in the sense that it's really the first attempt to use survey data from workers uh, in countries around the world uh, to try to understand really what is the difference in the nature of work globally uh, across countries. There's enormous interest these days on the future of work given AI and robots and new technologies. Um, just a couple of days ago, I was in Boston presenting uh, some of these results as well as other results to a task force on the work of the future at MIT, which has gotten a lot of university um, focus and attention. Um, in the last uh, development report of the World Bank, we co-hosted an event, a launch event here in Hong Kong it's also on the nature of work, right? So this paper kind of asks, what is the nature of work around the world? And how can we capture that at really the micro level with uh, really uh, 
granular data from different people, workers around the world. And just to motivate it a bit, um, in trying to describe the types of tasks that are actually involved in work, there's been a set of indices that have been developed by David Lahar Adamaki and others. Um, and they tend to focus on the idea that routine tasks are the ones that are being replaced by technology. Um, especially like clerical work or you know, in the industrial context, operators who do repetitive things, these are things that are pretty easy to replace by machines. And so they came up with this taxonomy of different aspects of work. One is non-routine analytical tasks. One is non-routine interpersonal tasks. Both of these are considered kind of higher end cognitive work that is very hard for to be replaced by uh, computers or other technology. And then we have routine cognitive, which is considered the most easily replaced or outsourced from rich countries. And then we also have routine manual and non-routine manual. And so these five um, characteristics of jobs have been used to characterize the changing nature of work in the United States, mostly, because that's where the measurement has been the strongest. And this plot is a pretty well-known pattern where you can see that it's these non-routine analytical or non-routine cognitive analytical interpersonal tasks that have been increasing over time. So you can see the red and blue lines just growing. This is like the average content of work of workers in the United States over time. Whereas this routine cognitive one is this green line, and it increased a little bit in the 60s, but since the 7, 1970, just pretty much declining. And this is the idea that these often are middle school jobs that have disappeared in the US. Um, and then the non-routine manual jobs have also declined, but not as much as the routine manual and routine cognitive. And this has been described as the hollowing out of the middle school jobs that increase wage polarization in the US and many other developed countries. So this is similar graphs for the EU, right? EU countries. Can I ask a question? Yeah. When you said routine cognitive is most easily outsourced, that's routine, both of these, any routine tasks are easily Okay, so if we think about what are the forces that affect uh, the nature of work in different countries, we focus on four kind of fundamental drivers or factors. One is technological change, and this is the one that gets the most attention, uh, automation, uh, robots. The second is globalization, and this is this outsourcing idea. And there's been a lot of discussion of this, some limited empirical evidence uh, that it's actually happening, that routine tasks are leaving richer countries and moving to poorer countries. Then structural change is something uh, that work in, especially in emerging markets and developing countries, has also been found to be important that, uh, for instance, in China, as the service sector has grown with, the, with rising incomes, it tends to be the case that many of these service sector jobs actually are fairly routine intensive, and this has led to an increase in routine jobs Chinese economy, kind of independent of all these other forces. And then finally, very important, of course, is the supply of skills, because uh, if you have better educated college graduates, if you have lots of them, then it's gonna be more likely to be economical to assign them to, com uh, to complete these non-routine cognitive tasks to accomplish different types of production objectives. Okay. Um, and this figure gives just some examples of what these uh, characteristics of jobs, uh, what they mean. So if we look at routine cognitive, repeating the same task, being exact or accurate, very structured work, it's generally considered to be easy to automate. Also the routine manual, easy to automate. And some examples of jobs that have a high routine cognitive content are office clerks, sellers, administrative workers, cashiers. And for, for the routine manual, it's production workers, especially machine operators, assemblers, and bosses. Um, and non-routine manual is often include things like drivers, although it's worth pointing out that you know, now we're now talking a lot about driverless cars, so it could be that some of these could actually be automated, right? But historically, they've kind of been thought of as hard to replace uh, with machines. But AI may be changing a lot of that. And then 
you know, all the high-end jobs, all of the high school jobs tend to be, you know, have a high non-routine cognitive yeah, college teachers would be there. Would be non-routine analytical. Definitely here. Yeah. You're doing analytic work. You're thinking hard. Yeah. You're solving complex problems. Your guy is a whole supervisor. Yeah, no, it's a good point because every job has all of this, right? So you can be have both this kind of, and have a lot of non-routine cognitive stuff, and but you can also have a lot of routine cognitive stuff as part of your job as well. So it's not one or the other, you get a score, every occupation gets scored on all of these. So yeah. It's a vector of characters. Yes, so that's also what we will do in our paper, that we that we quantify the routine and non-routine and cognitive and mind work concepts for each person. Whereas actually in the literature, quite often what people have did is that they just assign workers to groups, as you say. So the teachers are non-routine, that's it. And the accountants are routine, that's it. So we, we don't want to lose the nuance and say that there are different proportions of what we, what we do. So one of the big challenges in studying the nature of work is that there's a lack of data on actually what workers do in different environments. And uh, a lot of the, this uh, taxonomy of, of job tasks has come from the US because the US has this amazing database called the ONET database, which is produced by the Department of Labor in the US where they actually regularly go and do a very detailed taxonomy of what is involved in different occupations defined at a fairly disaggregated level. And so people have used the information from this database to construct occupation level measures of these different job tasks. And those have been, been widely used in the literature thus far. Oftentimes, to study what's going on in other countries, what people have done, because the US is the only country where the Department of Labor does this. In other countries, if scholars want to analyze this, they typically just assume that if you're doing the same, a, a specific occupation in some other country, then they assume it has the same job task as in the US. So if I'm a high-level manager, I just assume that the high-level manager in Poland or in China or in the UK is doing the same as a high-level manager in the US. And then you can just analyze changes in task content uh, by looking at changes in occupational structure, really, in other countries, right? And mapping the US uh, uh, taxonomy. And we think this is a really uh, bad assumption because a manager in China could be doing very different types of work than a manager in the US. And the only way to capture that is if you have separate measures of what people are actually doing in different countries. And that's what we've done. We've put together uh, a set of labor force surveys in 42 countries to study this question, where it's measured at the individual worker level in a consistent way. And so we can pick up whether, in fact, people uh, in China or Poland who have the same occupation as from the US are actually doing work, the nature of their work is actually quite different. And then that, of course, allows us also to try to then try to explain how these fundamental forces may be related to differences in the nature of work across countries, which is completely new, as far as I know, to, to do this type of work, to try to understand differences in the nature of work internationally, because mainly because of data limitations. Okay. Um, so, that's one of our biggest contribution is to just assemble all of this data together so that we can construct, construct these task content measures that are at the individual worker level and, uh, and, we, can, and we do a lot of work trying to make the measures con very consistent with those US ONET measures in terms of capturing the same concepts but then measuring them separately and independently in different countries. And as I mentioned, this is from 42 uh, countries um, and it's the first attempt to really, these are all the available data in the world that we know of, really, that, that, that we put them all together. So, uh, and, and after we do that, we then try to say, really, what of the, to what extent do these big forces that everyone is talking about contribute to understanding the cross-country differences in test content? Okay, so I'm going to stop here. All right. 
Right, so, so let me guide you through the methodology first. Uh, methodology of our measurement, actually, so how do we, how do we define these measures? Then I'll show some descriptive results because the first contribution of this paper is to, is to establish these measures which we hope can be used in the further research by, by us and by others. The second contribution is basically to establish the stylized fact about this cross-country differences in the nature of work also within occupations. And then the third part of the, of the presentation of my section would be to delve deep into the econometric exercise that we've done aimed at capturing what are the determinants of these cross-country differences when we try to capture these four main drivers that Albert showed in the second slide, so technology, globalization, structural change, and the supply of skills. So, our, the, so just to preview of our findings is that we will actually find that the occupations are really quite different across the world, and that these differences are in some occupations very strongly related to the development level and in the other occupations not necessarily but they are different around the world in terms of yeah in and then we will find that actually most of that most of these cross-country differences can be attributed to differences in the endowments in particular countries in technology we find that this is the most uh, relevant one it explains the largest share of the cross-country differences but the globalization matters as well, and the supply of skills too. And we will also show that the relative importance of these factors is different for various subgroups of workers. So not everyone is the same, not only in terms of different countries, but also how the occupation, how various low skilled, middle skilled, and, um, and high skilled occupations differ. So the role of these factors will be different for different groups. Briefly about the data. So, so we basically, as I said, we use all data available in the world. I mean, it's actually all data available in the galaxy. So there are three different sources. The first source is the PX survey. So the PX survey, which is a, the PX survey is a survey done by the OECD so far in 32 countries around the world. These are mainly high income countries plus a bunch of middle income countries that liked the survey and decided to join. Uh, the sample size is usually like 4,000 to 26,000 individuals, so they can be very different. What is basically a PM? A PM is a combination of a, of a skill survey comparable to, for instance, PISA, which you may know is a survey of 15-year-olds where, where kids, 15-year-old uh, kids are, are surveyed and their literacy, numeracy, and problem-solving uh, skills are, are being measured. So PIAC is an adult skill survey. In that sense, the skill component is, pro is, mo is more narrow than in, than in PISA, but it also include, includes a battle of questions about labor market behavior, and also about what people actually do at work. Do they solve problems? What do you do? Like, do you use computer? Do you solve problems? Do you talk to people? Do you guide, supervise others? Do you make speeches? And so on. Then STEP is a survey conducted by the World Bank in the developing countries, which is kind of a model after PIA. In particular, it includes a literacy test, and it includes the same questionnaire about skill use at work that we will use for our measure. So they compare them. And COLS, is the, we use the fourth way, if I remember correctly, of the China Urban Labor Survey, where that questionnaire about the skill use of work was translated into Chinese, and actually data was collected in these six cities, so we can add China to our sample. Briefly, just, keep, just bear, bear in mind that these surveys are not, in some countries they are not nationwide representative. They are representative for the survey areas. In particular, STEP is an urban survey. But as we will focus on routine and non-routine and largely cognitive work, the fact that we focus on urban samples is not really an issue because we don't really miss that much of, let's say, IT developers in rural areas in Laos, right? So there are not many of them. And for consistency, we will basically drop agriculture uh, workers from farming workers from 
from our study. So how do we proceed to construct our measures of task? There are basically two, the, the, the basic idea. So if you're dropping agriculture out of it, the fourth step, which is sectoral shifts, you can't have very bad, right? So the main, we so That's why you had 25%, 20%, 20%, 20%. There was nothing happening. Well, to some extent, but uh, to some extent, but in general, the structural change, if we have like 30 developed countries and 10 developing countries, so the structural change here basically is about manufacturing and services. And we also, we also so, yes, so in that sense. But please remember that if, if the focus is about this routine, non-routine, uh, non-routine, non-routine shifts, then, then actually what matters here are these urban labor markets anyway. So yes, we kind of underestimate the, the underestimate the structural change in the meaning of let's say urban rural divide. And we focus more on the structural change in terms of manufacturing, various types of services. And there is some, there is some agriculture involved there as well. Because we don't really drop agriculture as a sector, we drop like farming workers. But, but yeah, so to, to that extent, we, live, we, we underestimate the structural change uh, a little bit. What's the, what's, what's, what's our, what, how do we proceed with our measurement? So we basically take advantage of the fact that the PF survey was conducted in the, U, in the US. So we want to create a measure that is based on the survey data, that is a, that is a worker measure, but at the same time, we want it to be consistent with this all net measure that were in the US. So we will use the US PF data set to create, to look for combination of PF questions that at the occupational level in the US will basically replicate the distribution of routine and non-routine work in the US across occupations. So once we find these combinations of questions PIA that replicate these patterns, we can then apply the same questions to 41 other countries in our sample. Then we make sure that our measurement is consistent with the established measure in the literature. And what we get is a cross country uh, heterogeneity basically in, in what people do, what people do, do at work. So these are the questions. like, for instance, do you read news, do you read professional titles, or do you program computers, or do you make speeches and give presentations? They, the, 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 the list of answers is like, I do it every day, I do it every week, I do it once a month, uh, once a year, never. So that's more like a frequency, frequency type of questions. Um, instead, it's some of these questions instead are yes and no. Mm, but in PR it's basically the, the, the frequency, uh, the frequency, how often you how often you do them. It turns out that some people actually have tried to do more of uh, various measurements, uh, more consistent in terms of the definitions of questions with ONET. ONET defines as ONET quantifies how important for a given job is doing something like uh, solving problems or calculating prices, and also how advanced that, that, that function is. And it turns out that in worker survey, these questions don't work well. So people are much better in, com so, you, so the answers are much more comparable if you ask people how often you do something, rather than you ask them how important it is for you to use computer or to solve problems or to supervise people because that's largely subjective. So, so the way this, that's the reason why these surveys tend to be tend to be defined as how often to do that rather than asking about proportions or how advanced you are in doing something. 
Yeah, so th these will be the questions that we, these are the questions that we will use. So for the non-routine cognitive analytical, it will be whether people read the news as a part of their job, whether they need read professional journals rather than title, the title here, whether they solve program, problems or program uh, computers. For non-routine cognitive personnel, it's about supervising others, making speeches and giving presentations. Routine cognitive is about being able to change the order of tasks at work, uh, filling forms and not presenting to other people or not giving any speeches. And for manual, there's only a one question, unfortunately, which is, is, the, is your work physically demanding? We're not gonna use that a lot. I'll show you uh, soon, soon why. And these are the correlations that we get in the US with the owned tasks. So you can see that they are pretty high. So the correlations with the owned measure is like 0.77. And the lowest we get is for routine cognitive is 0.55. So what that, what that does it mean if you look at the distribution of occupations in the US? So this is the owned measure that Albert mentioned of the one most widely used for the US at the three-digit occupation level. So let's say 101, 102, 133, 42 are various types of managers, then 200 something are various types of professionals, and so on. And the red one is our measure. So you can see that we basically are able to replicate that pattern for the, for the US pretty well. You can also notice that we have a little bit lower variance between occupations than the owned measure. But at the same time, we have a within occupation variance that owner does not have at all. And for routine cognitive, you could see the same, that the jobs that are being routine int intensive are either uh, clerical jobs like here, or uh, plant and machine operators, which are here, and the non-routine will be actually professionals, managers, and, and, and so on. So having established these measures, we can then proceed to the country-specific measures. And from the last is like sort of like a clarification, there is no unit of tasks, so it's all relative. So the way we define our measure is that zero is always uh, a task intensity for the average American worker, and one is the standard deviation within the US. So if a country has a score like 0.5, that means that on the average workers in this country are like 0.5 American standard deviation above the US. And we're also going to create a, a steady measure of routine task intensity. So what does task mean? Task is an occupation or task? <coughs> no. So we, will, we have four tasks. Non-routine cognitive analytical, per, interpersonal, routine cognitive, and manual. So, so, these, yeah, so that, these are four tasks. It's measured at the individual level. Yes. Yeah, so each, each individual is assigned this, a vector of four tasks. And can I see the previous graph? This one. Code for an occupation. Yeah. Does the code for an occupation, suppose the occupation is a plant supervisor. Does a plant supervisor in the US mean the same as a plant supervisor in the US? In terms of in terms of occupational codes, it's all synchronized. That's the point of having ILO, uh, International Labor Organization, and revising the classification. In terms of actual task contents, how much how, what is the relative importance of routine and non-routine, we will show that they are different. But the classification should be synchronized and, and consistent. So if you're doing a managerial work, no matter the country, you should be assigned here. Yeah, if you do... It's, it's, of course, it's subject to coding errors in each country. Yeah. People in the country were not trained correctly, but by intention and, de and training definitions that are consistent. There is some noise related to, to errors in coding, or in, but uh, if you uh, if you assume that occupations are identical around the world and assign the owner task to all countries are vulnerable to these occupational coding errors. If we measure at the worker level and then just let's say average by industries, then we don't really care whether there is an error in the occupational coding because at the end of the day we will forget about the occupational codes because we just measure everything at the worker level from the survey data. I have one more question, and I apologize if this sounds a little provocative, but this comes from a deep skepticism of a finance professor who looks at 
so we use that instead of O, O, O. <laughs> so if you ask a person, do you do manual work or do you do non-cognitive, intelligent person? But we also don't like to, but we so I will take the thing which makes it look good, right? But it don't, but it don't. Because, because there are no questions like that. The questions that are in the survey are like that. Do you read professional journals as a part of your work? Do you supervise other people as a part of your work? Do you give speeches or presentations as a part of your work? Do you operate machinery as a part of your work? And then we use these questions about this sort of like narrow tasks to create these measures that we call non-routine, cognitive, analytical, and so on and so on. So, this, so these poor people out there, they don't even know, right? So they don't know that they speak prose. It's us who take their sentences and say, oh, guys, you speak prose. But if you ask someone, do you solve problems? You'd like to say yes, even if he doesn't. It's, it's worded in a very specific way. It's worded in a very specific way. So and also the point of the, so the, the, the point of having like the OECD spending gazillions of dollars on doing the serving across countries is kind of to ensure consistency. And the fact that they started testing that in the bunch of countries and then before they roll it out across the world is actually to kind of attenuate all the concerns that you share. Yeah. And also, as for any reporting bias, even if there's a reporting bias, as long as it's consistent, then we're looking at the difference in these responses across countries, not the change. Yeah, so. All right, let me move, let me move on. Let me move on. So, because we, we're sort of running out of time. So, and then we will create a, a measure of routine task intensity, which is basically uh, uh, a relative in, in importance of routine versus non-routine task, this one here, and I will focus on, on, on that in the most of my presentation. So the higher it is, the higher is the relative importance of routine task, the lower it is, the higher is the importance of, of, of the non-routine non -routine tasks. All right, so the stylized part. So the first stylized part is that in the richer countries, the importance, the intensity of the non-routine work is higher than in the poorer countries. These this correlations are, I mean, the, the slopes are pretty steep. So the gradient of GDP is GDP here. So the gradient of GDP is pretty is, is, is pretty strong. The, the highest non-routine scores can be found in, uh, in Scandinavian countries. US, you, you see zero. So the Scandinavian countries in New Zealand are above. Then we have a bunch of European countries plus Korea, let's say here, uh, uh, which are a little bit l less non-routine than, than the US. And then we find out that the, the developing countries are actually scored pretty low. So the average score of a, of a worker in Ghana, Georgia, or Turkey is like minus 0.7, minus 0.6. So that's like way to the left in the, let's say, of the American distribution. China, China's right on the line. China is right on, right on the line, it's here, right? So then we have non-routine cognitive personnel, it's very similar picture. Again, China is, in this case, a little bit above the line. Then when we look at the routine cognitive and manual, we actually find out that it's not a clear-cut relationship with the development level. So with, for the routine cognitive, there is a heterogeneity, but there is like a very, let's say, mellow inverse U shape pattern here, so the, so the routine tasks are very low in the, in the Scandinavian countries, in Singapore, Japan as well, but they're also low in the developing countries, like Bolivia, Colombia, uh, Ghana, Kenya, Skoro. the highest are in Southern and Central Eastern Europe. So, so you could see that like Latvia, Russia, Slovenia, but also Italy, uh, Armenia, okay, China is here, so above routine. And in manual, we're not going to use manual anymore in this paper. Why? Because you can actually see that there are only two countries where the intensity of manual task is supposedly higher than in the US, and this is Indonesia and Turkey. And so that means there is only one question to measure that. And obviously, that question isn't really synchronized as you raise your concerns across countries. That question is, in particular, is your job physically demanding? And that could be the case that people, you know, that the factory worker in factory worker in Kenya, it probably is a physically demanding work, but he or she may think that well, if 
farming job. That is truly physically demanding, not mine. So he will or she will answer no. Whereas in the US, like everything, everyone seems to be tired. Maybe they should get more paid leave that uh, paid leave than ten days uh, a year. Maybe that would help. So we're not gonna use manual anymore. Now let's just look at within occupation differences because because these differences here can be driven by the differences in the occupational structures. Rich countries have more managers, more professionals, they do more non-routine work. So let's look within occupation. Within occupation, we will find out that actually for the high-skilled occupations, there is a strong gradient. Now I've switched to the relative routine task intensity for presentation purposes, and I'm gonna use this relative task, routine task intensity from now on to the end of the presentation. You see that among the managers or professionals in richer countries, the, the, the task, the worker tasks are way less routine than in the poor countries. Again, China's on the line. It's exactly where the GDP uh, pattern would suggest. So the same for professionals. There is a negative pattern here. The professionals in the richer countries do more non-routine work than professionals in the poorer countries. But then when we look at the middle skill or low skill occupations, again, we find the heterogeneity, but there is no clear-cut development-related pattern. So clerical jobs are different. Some of them are non-routine, some of them are very routine, but it's very, very no correlation with GDP. The same for pen and machine operators, right? A slight inverse U pattern, but it's basically not strongly related to GDP per capita. And just the final like a uh, measurement slide. There's another argument that it's largely related to the country-specific measurements. Because here is the average of the RTI, so the relative task, routine task intensity, among high-skilled occupations, just like managers, professionals, and technicians together. And the, the dark red line is the score you get when you assign all that task, so when you assume that, that occupations are identical across the world. So you basically get very little variance between countries which are driven by a difference at the finer occupational structural level. When we assign our survey data calculated for the US, we again get a kind of a, like a flat pattern across countries. Then when we do country-specific measurement, we see that there is a lot of heterogeneity, right? So people just basically, you know, supervise hours less in poor countries than they supervise hours in, in rich countries. What's the fear, what, what's this theory behind the allocation of, of tasks? Because our, it's a cross-country paper, so we have to think about the allocation of tasks, not only as a, like a women firm problem, but sort of as a global problem, right? So we think about the allocation of tasks as being endogenously assigned by employers. We don't really want to think about the occupation as a, as a unit of task here, because assigning a task to a worker is a kind of same as defining his occupations or the other way around. So we're not gonna use occupations from for a while now here. And the simple Roy model would show you that this uh, that the higher demand for non-routine work in a country or, or the lower supply of educated workers should lead to the most educated workers specialized in non-routine tasks and the abundance of low skilled workers should actually make them specialized in the routine, routine tasks. And in a global sense, that may actually mean that the theories of offshoring that show that countries that are, that countries that are poorer can specialize in, in offshoring of these low skilled jobs. If you add allocation of tasks into that, you can actually expect that the low skilled workers in poorer countries should actually perform more routine work than the, than the low skilled workers in the, in the richer countries. So to capture these patterns, or to test these patterns, we're gonna estimate a bunch of worker level regression uh, models to, to find these correlates uh, of routine intensity at the worker level. But we will mainly use sector and country level variables, which are plausibly exogenous to that firm uh, decisions about the allocation of, of tasks. So we're gonna capture four main factors, technology, globalization, uh, structural change, and skills uh, and demographic characteristics. How do so it sounded like in your data you did not just have the task specific routine, but then they were also measuring people's skills? Yes, there's a literacy test, like a reading comprehension test. But are you not using that before? 
we, we use that as a right hand side variable, not as a task measure. We're gonna use liter the skill measure to understand why people are assigned different tasks, in particular whether people with higher cognitive skills do more non-routine work, yes, but we don't really treat a measure of skill as a measure of task. Because the that you want to have let's say you you want to have for two jobs uh, an accounting job so you want to set up a competence uh, like a shared services center for accounting but you also want to outsource a project management job so then if you have let's say India and you have let's say China then if the workers in India have higher skills than the workers in China or the other way around then you will outsource the accounting job to the less skilled nation and the project management job to the more skilled nation, right? So it's not only about whether you outsource accounting to a more skilled nation, because that you assume for a second that you outsource only one type of job. If you have a heterogeneity of jobs that you can outsource, then you might end up with the less demanding jobs in less skilled countries anyway, because you're not picking the one location, you're just allocating different jobs to different countries. So we kind of expect that the countries with more skills should end up with more advanced work anyway at the end of the day. All right, let me introduce the variables that we control for, that we use for particular factors. So I think that there's going to be clearer what, how we use these skills. So how do we gonna measure technology? We're gonna measure technology mainly with the country sector share or probability of using computer at work. We also control for country sector robot stock and for ICD capital stock at the country level but that's only for a subsample of countries. Globalization we're going to control with the foreign, volume, foreign value added share in domestic output. This is why we use measure of, of exposure to offshoring. Uh, and also by the FDI stock. Uh, the structural change we just introduced, we introduced 90 sectors and we have the sector 50 facts. And the skill supply we use education dummies so like primary educated, secondary educated, and college educated workers. But we also have this measure of literacy skills. So we have people assigned to five groups based on their uh, basically reading test. Uh, I have a question. So it is a cross-section of, of countries, right? So you use the word structural change. So that's what time series says, right? Yeah, so in that sense, it's more about stru structure. structures, I mean, economic structures in different countries, right? So you use the word fixed effects. So what is fixed effects that you have a bank? It's basically a dummy for a it's a dummy for a for a sector. It's a dummy for a sector. Yes, it's a and dummy for a sector. In globalization you have it for the whole country, it's not country sector. It's country sector. It's country sector. The technology and globalization variables are country sector. We can measure we we can measure the 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 share of computer the, the share of computer use at each country sector. 42 countries times 19 sectors. It's the same with globalization variables and also with robots. So these are sector level variables. So workers in a country will differ according to sector in the exposure to, to globalization and technology. And, and this uh, research design will assume that all these four fundamental factors are orthogonal to each other. I mean, there are all these interactions that are taking place, right? If a country's technology in some then they may be offshoring more in that sector. I 
things like that. So they're all Yes, yeah, so in that sense, we, with, with a cross country data, you couldn't really get much more out of it because we don't, if we had, if we had some kind of a variation over time, then we could understand how these interactions between exposure to technology and exposure to globalization interact with each other, right? Here we don't really know whether a country with a higher exposure to offshoring and a higher exposure to technology at the same time, and what what comes first, here, really? So it's more of a so it's more of a like a growth accounting exercise that you that you attribute the cross country differences into and down into different endowments, right? Right. So they're all shared experience in that they're all going to be in the same regression, so they're controlling for all the other factors, but we don't model the interactions. The way I'm thinking about it is like a growth accounting exercise. When you decompose, let's say, the cross-country differences in GDP into contributions of endowments in physical capital, ICD capital, human capital, and let's say total factor productivity. So we don't really say that 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 higher physical capital in China is the reason for higher GDP in comparison, let's say, to Laos, but you say that these differences are can be attributed to you assess the relative importance of these factors, right? Well, but it's not adopted to the same right. degree. So it's capital, right? so it's, it's ICT capital usage, or okay, it could be, but it's not necessarily available in this model. Well, but can actually, I mean, all of the macro cross country research suggests that productivity is hugely different across countries, so technologies are hugely different across countries. And even though, in theory, you're right, there are many software. Technology is different across countries. You know, so the at all. I think all the evidence would support that. So it's a kind of a, you know, so the fact that someone, you know, so it's not really a case that this technology is like spread across the world immediately these days. Uh, you know, I know that Angry Birds were adopted by 50 million users after five weeks, and that's much faster than was the case with TV. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, these were all mobile phone users. So what matters for us is, let's say, the fact that some countries have higher share of mobile phone users and the other countries have lower share of mobile phone users because they are not 100% everywhere. And even if you look at the at the at the you know the robot stock, for instance, it's hugely different across the world. This ICD capital stock. So we basically. Yeah, so, so we're not think, so we're not using the word t technology in a kind of a philosophical sense. Like right? there is a technology frontier, but we account for the fact that the adoption in some countries is very far from the frontier, and we quantify the stock or the adoption. Yes. So yeah, and the all right. So. Uh, I think then, so when we run these regressions, we're also going to use the, the two exercises. We're just going to basically use the estimated coefficients to to decompose the cross-country variance in routine tasks, and we will also decompose the differences between our reference countries in the U.S. and other countries for for different country for different country groups using this this equation. So first of all, let me start with saying that technology matters here, despite semantic trouble. So here, so the higher the computer is, the lower is the routine task intensity, and and that the coefficient is pretty pretty large here. But also you can see that that effect is even stronger among for workers who are in the high skilled occupations, so for professionals, managers, and technicians, and it's basically insignificant and way smaller for workers in other occupations, right? Then when we look at the at the, at the coefficients for, for the globalization variables, 
we actually find out that something, something completely the opposite happens. So, in general, countries, workers who are more exposed to offshoring perform more non-routine tasks, but their effect overall is, that, that moderate effect overall hides uh, an important heterogeneity because exposure to offshoring seems to be basically irrelevant for the high-speed workers, for workers in high-speed occupations, but for workers who are basically in the factory jobs, this exposure to offshoring is highly correlated with the routine task intensity. On, moreover, we also interact that foreign value-added share variable with the GDP per capita to grasp that, 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 that conjecture that the offshoring should actually have a different impact in a different group of countries. So we expect that in the poor countries, exposure to offshoring will be associated to more routine jobs, and in the rich countries would be tasks, and in the rich countries would be associated to the less routine tasks. So that's actually a point of organizing uh, the production across the borders. And we find, and we find evidence that is consistent with that. Because, but because the estimate on the, the coefficient of the interaction with GDP is negative, uh, and it's actually negative for, for all the working, working groups. So even for the low-skilled occupations, I mean, uh, the high GDP kind of moderates that effect. And with the, foreign, for, with the exposure to FDI, uh, you know, it kind of higher exposure to FDI among the lowest workers in the in the factory jobs reduces the routine task intensity. And when we look at skills, skills clearly matter. So workers who are more educated perform less routine tasks. That's kind of trivial. But on top of that, on top of that, workers who have higher literacy skills uh, perform less routine tasks. And actually, these effects are. These effects are, are again the strongest for the for the workers in the high skilled in the high skilled occupations. Um, all right, and then about the demographic characteristics, uh, we find out actually that females are more likely to per perform more routine intensive work. Uh, basically, you know, in, uh, when you control for for other all other uh, factors. And also the young workers tend to perform more routine tasks than the older workers. But, you know, that's not actually something that drives uh, cross-country differences in this average uh, routine and non-routine uh, task intensity. That's, that's why, why this is happening, that's probably a, a different story. So, overall... So, so all these, uh, the slides before, so these are for the entire sample, right? Yes. You're not doing it country by country. No, this is a full regression. I mean, estimating country by country is a kind of. Uh, but some countries may be very different from other countries in these types of conclusions that you make, right? Yes, but uh, you know, if you estimate, if you estimate that model on a, if you estimate a, this model, but if you, let's say you, you estimate this model for the U.S. and then for China separately, right? So what you, what we are mainly interested in is to understand why the Chinese workers do more routine tasks than the, than the US workers. And whether it's because they have lower skills or less technology or are more exposed to offshoring than the American workers. If you regress that country by country, what you're basically capturing is, to, is why some workers in China do less routine work than other workers in China. And it doesn't tell us anything about these cross-country differences within the same occupations that, that we find that yeah, we... I understand what you're doing, but I may also be interested in finding out, for example, whether females in China do the yeah. smart, non-cognitive tasks, whereas the females in the United States do the dumb, routine tasks. Mm. So, I've actually... I've actually so, I agree with you. In fact, we want to do a paper about China. This cross country, remember, we didn't do that because I mean, my experience is when you try to do decomposition exercises where you allow both the coefficient and the covariate to be both changing at the time, it's always very hard to explain the variation in the coefficients in a meaningful way because yeah. it's just there's something structurally different in these countries and it's usually a lot of storytelling. So, we thought as a first step, it's better to try to look at the, the kind of global relationship. 
relationship between these things and then to understand the differences across countries yeah. by the differences just in the covert. And the I've actually uh, I've actually I've, I've done the I've done the regression uh, I've done the country specific regressions principally aimed at capturing whether that fit that whether the gender gap is consistent across country and it actually is. So in like, the vast majority of countries is gonna be significant and positive, right? So it's it, it, it's not really, you know, it, this coefficient on, let's say, on the gender effect, it's not driven by, by, by pooling. If we do it country by country, we find a very consistent uh, stylized fact that females are being allocated more routine tasks than, than men. Also, other, other data sources from Europe also show that. That when you control for occupation sectors, uh, papers for academia also show that, that you know, men do more run routine work in academia, and women do more routine work in academia, like editing websites for departments. I'm not sure if that's truly global, but it happens. Uh, yeah. So then the various decomposition, the various decomposition, because this, you know, this coefficient doesn't really take into account the differences in the endowments. So now when we when we use the differences in the endowments and, and the coefficients to decompose the cross-country variance and quantify the relative role of various factors. We find out that the that the technology is the factor that that that, that explains that, that predicts the largest chunk of the entire variance in, in, in tasks, followed by globalization here and then and then by by skills. If we do it by by, by worker groups, then we find out that the importance of technology is even higher for workers in the high speed occupations, which is actually consistent with this routine replacing technological change hypothesis that suggests that ICD is complementary with the high speed work. Uh, and the contribution of the other factors are much smaller here. But for but if you look at the low scale occupation, it actually turns out quite different. Because the globalization contributes the most here, right? For the cross country variance among the factory workers basically. Okay, now we go the matter. Considering the level of supply of skills in high skill, middle skill and low skill, all those numbers are very small. They're small. Because it's not capturing the differences across the groups. Yeah. The biggest skill differences are the difference between high school and middle school. This is saying within middle school. I mean, yeah. The so the point is that if you, if you look at all the professionals in the world or, or IT developers in the world, they don't really differ in the literacy skills that much. They differ a little. They differ much more in, in their exposure to technology and, and, and offshoring. Then actually, they are tertiary, they are college educated anyway. So, and they all have literacy, high, relatively high literacy skills, right? So, the importance of supply of skills overall is large because that's a full sample. So, we can add, so the fact that, the, so, so differences between literacy uh, ex explains a lot of differences in tasks across. But then, when we look only at like professionals and managers, then it's not really difference in their skills across countries. It's more about their exposure to technology. And then when you look at the factory workers, like plant machine operators, craftsmen, they basically all have low literacy skills. So again, skills are not that relevant to understand differences between them. Because there are very few like highly skilled workers there in terms of literacy and education. So it's largely about the, the, the globalization though, for that group. Okay? Let me now present a similar decomposition but from a different angle. We're just now going to assign countries to three groups, lower and middle income countries that start in terms of GDP per capita with Kenya and with Turkey, the bottom high income countries, which are basically Southern European countries, Central Eastern European countries that are in the EU, plus Chile and South Korea, and the top high income countries, like from France and Richard, basically. And then we're going to present the difference, decompose the differences between each country and the US by these country groups to see whether these factors play a different role in a different country. So overall, we find that that of course the differences the differences here are much larger than than these differences. So so we find out that uh, so we do find that we have uh, uh, this strong that, that mainly can be attributed to technology, but the other factors are relevant here as well. The proportions of these factors are similar for the bottom. Uh, high income countries, 
But then when we look for, for groups of workers, where we find that for the high skill, then when we look for the workers in the high skill occupations, and we look by country group, then we find that yes, the skills will matter, but basically they, they matter for the in the case of low and middle income countries, right? So for low and middle income countries, the contribution of skills becomes significant. For bottom high income countries, not really, right? So that's why you don't really see the, the skills in the overall decomposition, but if you look at the country groups, then skill emerges relevant for, for poor countries, basically. And technology is actually very relevant for, for both. For middle skill work, that in plain language, does that mean that for the rich countries, skills don't matter? That means that, that in the rich countries, the differences between skills are really very, very small. No they don't explain the cross country they don't, differences. They don't the, US. the differences in, in skills so don't explain the cross country differences between the US. Because let me put it this way the Polish workers aren't really less skilled than the American workers as a pool, right? So the difference in the technology endowment and the role and the role in a global value chain between Poland and the US is much larger than the difference in the skill structure of the workforce. Yeah, 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 I should, I should, I should speed up here, yes. And so for the low skilled occupations, we find actually that the globalization matters, matters most, right? So for the low skilled occupations, we find that it's not about technology. So for workers in the, fact, in the craft and, and planning and machine operators and, and laborers, basically we find that it's the globalization that explains the most of the country difference. So, and, and to shed additional light on the role of the, of the, on the globalization here, we're just now gonna split workers into two groups, but in a different manner. So we're gonna split workers into workers in offshoreable occupations and workers in non-offshoreable occupations. We use the Blender Kruger 2013 classification. You see that the share of workers in offshoreable jobs Difference between countries broadly from like six percent in Canada, Austria, but also Ghana, or, or to more than twenty percent in Central and Eastern European countries. And then we're gonna re-estimate re 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 our model separately for workers in these offshoreable jobs and non-offshoreable jobs. And what we find then is that these drivers, these determinants of the cross-country differences in tasks, are very different for the workers in offshoreable and non-offshoreable occupations in particular. Oh yeah, that's business, I mean, that should be a, I'm sorry, mistake by. So what we find here is basically that for workers in non-offshoreable occupations, the importance of computer use and exposure to technology is very large, and the importance of a foreign value-added share, um, the foreign value-added share is insignificant. For workers in offshoreable occupations, the technology does not matter at all, doesn't matter, but the, the coefficient of the foreign value added share is large, right? And very significant. So when we apply our decomposition to, ah, oh, some slide was lost, so uh, I'm sorry for that. So, um, so one slide is lost, uh, it's not yeah, good. So we have to, yeah, it, 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 we lost that slide, yeah? We wrote, we wrote it up anyway. So when we, when, we, when, we, when, when we actually do our decomposition by country groups for the workers in offshoreable and non-offshoreable occupations, we find out that the, for the non-offshoreable occupations, technology contributes the most, but for the workers in the offshoreable occupation, 60% of cross-country differences can be attributed to globalization, one third to skills, and technology doesn't matter at all. And you should remember, bear in mind that these offshoreable occupations are Planned and machine op 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 uh, operators, but also IT developers. So they are distributed across the skill spectrum, but they are just you know offshore, easy to offshore or for tough to offshore. Final slide: When we double check whether occupations really matter, and and we estimate our model controlling for the occupations, uh, we find out that the when we control for occupations, it doesn't really seem that we don't really explain more. We we assign a little bit less of the explanatory power to skills, but of technology, exposure to technology is still significant. So you cannot really explain these cross-country differences with, with, with differences in the occupational structure. It's largely about these four factors that we, uh, that we have. 
So just to sum up, there, there, just to sum up we find that the occupations are in different around the world. Workers in high-skilled occupations, in high-skilled occupations, these differences are the most strongly related to differences in the development level. Technology contributes the most to the cross-country differences in, in worker tasks, followed by globalization and skills, even though the relative importance of these drivers are different for various occupations. Technology matters most for the high-skilled workers in the high-skilled occupations, while globalization for workers in the low-skilled occupations and uh, offshoreable occupations. So that's it. Thank you very much. We're a bit over the last time, but are there any questions to Ms. Tigger? Okay. All right, then. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much.